Welcome to the first episode of the 16th series, everyone. This series, we are diving into some really great wuxia territory with the Hearts of Wulin RPG by Lowell Francis from The Gauntlet and Agatha Chang from Asians Represent. But before we get there, I'd really love to introduce our guest host for this series, in lieu of Amelia still on break, currently enjoying Disney World as of the time of this recording, we have invited Adira Slattery to join us. And as is the tradition here on Character Creation Cast, we like to get to know our guests. In this case, if anyone is not familiar with them or their work, um, Adira, thank you for joining us for the series. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Really excited to be here. Yeah, we were so. I, I am super excited to have you here. This is, uh, it was such a fun recording with you. Yeah. And I can't wait for uh, everybody to hear it. Mm hmm. But first, let's let our listeners get to know you a bit more. Um, could you tell us a bit more about yourself and what sort of projects you have going on right now? Yeah. So, um, uh, I'm Adira Slattery. Um, I was on season two of A Woman with Hollow Eyes here on the One Shot Network. Um, which uh, you can watch the recordings of that in uh, the Twitch uh, VODs and also on YouTube. Um, I also make a lot of little games myself, uh, currently mostly little games. Um, <laughs> I've been uh, releasing them all on my itch page, uh, adira.itch.io. Um, otherwise, you can just sort of find me by Googling my name. There's just just me, Adira Slattery. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, follow me on Twitter, at Adira Slattery. Uh, look at my fun little LARPs on itch. There you go. So what would you say is your favorite character creation system that you've ever created a character for or just looked into? Hmm. So I think my favorite character creation system is actually the life path system from Ooh, Nobilis yeah. third edition. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Um, so part of it involves like drawing these circles on a page and like picking flowers and answering all these different questions. Mm -hmm. And I just really, really like it. It creates a very interesting and like holistic look at the character and at their backstory and things like that. And it's also kind of funny that you sort of then throw it out for a little bit while you actually like fill in stats and things. Oh, cool. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, I I remember we did the, the life path system uh, for Traveler mm -hmm. uh, 2.0, I believe it was. Uh, and I really enjoyed that, even though I got the short end of the, end of the stick every single mm -hmm. moment. Yeah. Uh, every roll. Yeah. But uh, that, that's kind of half the fun, it seems. Well, a life path and Traveler and life path and Noblest are actually very different. I can imagine. Yeah, Life Path and Traveler is like dice rolling and random events and like all the sort of yeah. history stuff. Whereas Life Path and Nobilis is like you're picking these like conceptual flowers to represent different mm. aspects of the character. And it's causing you to answer questions about like their heart and their shadow and then like determining oh, nice. uh, all these different like things about your character's like philosophy and outlook. Well, that makes me want to actually look into doing more life path systems on uh, on our on our normal series. That that sounds really cool. Yeah, they're a lot of fun. Awesome. Well, we do have a couple more cold opens left this series, uh, so I think we'll save the other questions uh, for those, uh, so that this one doesn't go very very long. Uh, like it very well could, because <laughs> I, I have a feeling I could talk to you for a while. Um, but we're very, very happy to have you along for the series. Yeah, thank you so much again for having me. And if you like what we're doing here at Character Creation Cast, please consider giving us a rating and review on Apple Podcasts or any of the other services that allow reviews. These help tremendously and allow others to find the podcast easier. Simply head to itunes.charactercreationcast.com to get to our Apple Podcasts page. Leaving a rating is fine and it helps, but if you read it a review, Ryan and Amelia, the regular hosts, will read it out during their cold opens at some point. For now, just sit back, relax, and I'm excited to get to the show. Yes, enjoy.
Welcome to Character Creation Cast, a show where we discuss and create characters, the best part of role-playing games, with guests using their favorite systems. I'm one of your hosts, Ryan, and this episode, my guest co-host, Adira, and I welcome Agatha Chain and Lowell Francis. Did I get those names right? You absolutely did. Wonderful. <laughs> uh, creators of the game we're going to be covering today, Hearts of Ulin, a Powered by the Apocalypse game for telling melodramatic stories of the Wuxia. Welcome to Character Creation Cast. We're really excited you could join us. Awesome. Thank you. Hello. Thanks for having hey. us on. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, let's start by introducing you for our audience. Agatha, can you tell us a bit more about yourself and any projects you're currently involved in? Well, as of our, the One Shot Network, I'm actually a co-host to Asians Represent, which is another podcast where we celebrate diversity from an Asian perspective. So my co-host and I, uh, Daniel Kwan, we interview uh, guests who are Asian uh, from the analog gaming community. And we also have, right now have a an actual play going on where we've created a new setting, a, a pan-Asian city in masks, and we are playing through it. It's it's very it's very dramatic. People are going through <laughs> yeah. some emotional times. Nice. <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, and Lowell, how about yourself? Uh, I'm actually uh, the co-host of the Gauntlet podcast on the, the Gauntlet sort of family of uh, podcasts, and I'm sort of the role-playing hangouts coordinator for the Gauntlet community, and I'm also a blog at Age of Ravens, uh, which we won an any for that back in 2017, and uh, right now that's over on the, the Gauntlet blog. We've moved over there for a, a weekly po- uh, post there. Oh, cool. Very nice. All right, well, let's go ahead and get into this. Uh, We will start by discussing what this game is all about. What's in a game? All right, since this is a new game, uh, can you give us a quick pitch for the game, like the genre, the settings, uh, and anything else pertinent to a wonderfully rehearsed pitch? So the touchstone that we'll give people is Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, Mm -hmm. but... We are all about the feels. Ah. Uh, this is a game of uh, wuxia melodrama and melodrama first, romance and heartbreak and pain. Uh, and then when that gets to be too much, you get to punch each other in the face <laughs> and, and do the fights and you get to be awesome there where maybe the, the you can't get through the heartbreak, but you can beat other people up. And so that's sort of the balance of the game. That's awesome. Punch your feels away. Nice, nice, yes. nice. <laughs> so, what sort of things do we use to play this game? Like, is are we going to be rolling dice? Do we need books, cards? What do we got? Yes, yeah, because this is powered by the apocalypse. We are go- everyone will be using two d six, so that's two d six dice, and uh, and you'll need uh, the core rule book if you're playing online. Um, <laughs> It, you'll, you'll need the same thing in a character keeper. But anyway, that's getting into the specifics <laughs> of how I play. Yeah, but generally, that's pretty much all you need. 2d6, the the rules, uh, and then the character sheets and pencil. Mm-hmm. Nice. Very cool. And then uh, we touched on it a little bit with the genre uh, talk, but what do characters specifically do in this game? So one of the things is... is uh, as many games do the building of relationships and bonds to start, we have these entanglements that tie each uh, characters together and tie them to NPCs. And uh, they're about some of them are about romance and some of them about their other obligations to, to people. And so those are sort of the engine to drive it. So in the game, you're trying to, you know, get your lover to love you. You're trying to, you know, break up somebody else. Uh, uh, we usually have kind of a starter situation and it, the starter situations often look like wuxia movies mm-hmm. where, oh, there's a tournament or, oh, there are people are coming together for a festival or, oh, there's this missing scroll. Uh, but very quickly it devolves into, I can't believe you did that to me. <laughs> and, you know, how is this happening? Mm-hmm. And, uh, very much you are exploring your characters lives and identities and, uh, you know, how they they deal with obligation and uh, the, the matters of the heart. Yeah. Awesome. And I, I'm going to add to another thing that's pretty unique about this game is that, well, it's not set in historical China because it's based on a genre, a fictional genre. So we've we've uh, taken great pains to make sure that it's not 
you know, it's not historically specific because that will be too much of a barrier for most people. Mm-hmm. Uh, however, uh, there there's a lot of this game that actually, it, I think when, when Lowell was writing a lot of the rules, it was... Uh, unintentionally, he incorporated a lot of uh, well, com- like Confucius uh, values, which are also kind of like Chinese values, into mm. the game, and that's a really fun way. Uh, even in like the entanglements, where for example, one of them is that oh, uh, um, I'm in love with so and so, but my teacher uh, it despises them, and this in this case, this is my teacher is just as important to me as uh, as this person I'm in love with, which is um, from a more collectivist society, uh, or at least in the historical times. Mm-hmm. It's maybe not as so, not, not so much now, but yeah, the, the, they were placed on almost equal importance. And in some cases, one more than the other. And the one that's more important is your relationship with your teacher and your respect and your obedience mm-hmm. to them. So this is, and because this is already a choice that you can, one of the options that you can choose from in the game, that means that as a player, when I choose that, I I accept that these are things that are very important to my character and they are, and you're in a way experiencing an aspect of this culture that is very unique to this game, I think, and very fun. Mm-hmm. Awesome. So there are a lot of different Powered by the Apocalypse games out in the world. What makes this game unique compared to the other ones? Yeah, so I think basically what I said before about the cultural aspect of it in a way where it's not pedantic. So you're not, I'm not, this game is not like, let me teach you how what Chinese people used to think. <laughs> um, it's it's just, this is a fun game where you get to have feels, where you get to uh, punch and or kick and or hit people over the head with a fan. But you're also um, just experience a very tiny slice of what it might have been like to have these values um, in these times. Mm -hmm. So normally uh, we talk about the history of the system, but since this is a a brand new system, I wanted to ask uh, a few questions about the development process. So first of all, why? Why Hearts of Woodland? Why did we why did we go ahead and make this game? So I I have for a number of years uh, adored uh, these Chinese wuxia uh, TV series mm. uh, that it wasn't until much later that I realized that many of them were based on novels and that there was a whole cultural milieu that these these came out of with some authors that are huge uh, and that these shows have been made and remade and all, all of that. I found them years ago. Netflix had some of these on and I got them and I watched them and I fell in love. And I'd already, you know, liked Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon. Mm-hmm. But these shows had long arcs and people changing and complicated things and tons of characters. And uh, I really loved that. And so I tried to do that with some other systems, uh, including Hacking Storyteller and uh, uh, an earlier version with PBTA that were terrible uh they were they were terrible they were they were super complicated and super filled with lots of detail and trad approaches and you know okay we've got to get our maneuvers we got to get these three elements together Mm -hmm. and that kind of thing and uh i kind of gave up on that at a certain point uh i'd had a conversation with renee knipe uh and she had talked about the importance of romance in these stories and then I played Monster Hearts, mm. and I was like, "Okay, uh, th- it can be done. Uh, the The game can can work that way." And uh, it came from me loving those stories and wanting to get them out on the table, and realizing that we had some tools out there between Monster Hearts and Masks and some other games, and it started me pulling those ideas together to to make this game. Very cool. So. Uh, Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon is sort of like a like massive, like almost like exaggeration and like parody at some points of some of the different like Wuxia tropes. Are you guys like trying to like really lean into uh, that sort of like knowledge of the genre sort of like required for playing this game? Um, or is your hope that this game can just be like anyone can jump in and do all sorts of cool Wuxia stuff? 
I think that's a great question, and I have a clarifying question to ask. Oh, by the way, uh, the the term is pronounced wu xia. So wuxia. anytime Thank you. X in like yeah, pinyin, mm-hmm. like Chinese pinyin, is always pronounced like sh in English. Awesome. Similarly, uh, c, uh, if it's uh, there's a letter just c, then it's pronounced like ts in English. Okay. Uh, <laughs> and so on and so forth. We'll all. <laughs> I can always jump in again later. Thank you, thank you. Please, please correct me. <laughs> yeah. So, um, I, when you say that Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon is like a parody of the wuxia genre, what did you mean by that? So, I mean, like everything that I've heard in talking with different people about Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon is that, like, to a lot of people who are incredibly familiar with the genre and with a lot of different things, that some of the like things that it takes and interests and like things that it explores are just these like massive exact like like huge like almost like exaggerations of some of the stories that other things in the genre tell um and that like i've talked to people about like oh i really like crouching or hidden dragon and they're like oh that's really funny because like it's the part of the reason why it might be really popular in like america america is because it is this like massive sort of like exaggeration that like i in my cultural consciousness wouldn't be able to pick up a lot of the like subtleties and like real interplay in the genre for people who like are actually like familiar with it that's a that's a great oh lol did you have i've heard that reading before and i don't know if i entirely agree with Mm it i think that that there's an element more of of homage that's going on certainly uh, I think Ang Lee is is drawing from that because those traditions are so established and he's working with that. Now, one of the things is that, that – and Agatha maybe can speak more to this – is that this particular genre comes out of – there are older novels, but it came from a set of authors in the 1950s in Hong Kong that wrote these these novels and really established these tropes. Like Tolkien made, made orcs and elves and dwarves. Mm-hmm. Things that then other people, you know, have, have used and reused and kind of set the template. These novels set the template for what the stories were about, what people could do in these stories, uh, what was important in them. And, uh, I, th- I think that Ang Lee is taking those things and it, 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 I don't know if parody, I think, really reusing them in a new way, remixing and and saying, you know, this this is what we've done before. Let me show you how we do it in a fine arts form. All right. Um, but that's just my reading. Of I it. will I will come in here. I don't have an opinion on Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, because the last time I saw it, I was, I believe, uh, in grade five <laughs> and <laughs> five or six, somewhere around there. And I saw it with my dad. But I will tell you my mm-hmm. dad's opinion on it. And my dad is is uh, is a cinephile. He used mm-hmm. to watch a lot of film and he, a little less so now. But um his opinion on it, uh, as someone who's definitely a first immigration immigrant from Taiwan, um, mm-hmm. is that what he didn't like about Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon was it's it's not that it's um, it's a parody of the wuxia genre and tropes, but it's that um, he said this film is made for North America. Mm-hmm. It, this, yeah. this, or not North America. This film is made for the West. I think specifically he said this film is made for white people, but uh, <laughs> let's contextualize. Uh, Fair enough. Yeah. What, he, what he meant is that, yeah, because this this part is true, according to him. Again, I'm just quoting my dad. Don't quote me. Um, <laughs> He's saying he was saying that there was a there was a lot of times where um, some things that would be implicit in other uh, Chinese media made for Chinese people mm-hmm. that are like cultural values or like expectations uh, where you know how a person would respond to this. Instead, they are stated explicitly um, in the film. And that is the part, I think, that actually um, rubs him the wrong way. And I, th- and I think it's very interesting. Uh, I'm very curious about who these people were that yeah. you were chatting with, who, uh, Adira that were saying that, oh, th- they're kind of, uh, magnifying these wuxia tropes when in fact they might be magnifying, uh, cultural expectations, mm-hmm. which is, which is just really fascinating. Yeah, awesome. But I, I will go back to answer the question, which is about <laughs> whether this game is supposed to be, uh, more for Wuxia fans. So people who are like, I already love this and I want to replicate this kind of story um, in this game, or can they be played by anyone? And I think 
I do think that this game would first of all be more appealing <laughs> maybe to uh, people who already love the genre and I do think in a way like if you already have a love for it then it, it this is our love letter to our fellow fans um, mm-hmm. just like um, let's see just like Monster of the Week is sort of like a love letter to all the people who watch Supernatural <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, and uh, on the other hand we are going to be and this is part of partly why so Lola is the genius behind all of the mechanics basically um, <laughs> and I'm going to be coming on to write all of the cultural context um, mm-hmm. and the, uh, the the genre context as well for people so we, cool. we are going to do our best to make sure that it is the most approachable to anyone mm-hmm. um, um, uh, possible and a part of how to emulate the genre and how to emulate the the tone as well as the cultural context is written to the rules already outside of like whatever little blurbs that I'm going to write about oh what is Chinese culture <laughs> and so on and so forth so I think it, it you will definitely love this if you love the wuxia genre but I think um, anyone can play it as well uh, if they choose to because we are going to provide the tools for them Mm -hmm. That's one of the things I absolutely love about Powered by the Apocalypse games is it's very easy for people that don't know the particular genre to approach a Powered by the Apocalypse game, especially if they played other PBTA games um, and jump in and through the character creation, through the, the basic moves and the character moves and things like that, and just through play it's it kind of comes naturally that you're emulating these uh, specific genres and it it you don't need any previous conceptions of what the genre is like because you're learning it a bit through play especially if you're just paying attention to how things are going and and i would love it if we can provide a toolkit for people to go back and and look at these these series and and movies and and see these things and maybe even get people to to watch these series mm-hmm. and you know I would love that and get more attention and then maybe more people more, more of these will get more good ones will get translated <laughs> um uh for the for the west yeah very cool well speaking of play testing uh how has play testing been going with this game we've done a very loose process with that yeah. uh i i had a uh, a a rough version that I ran on the gauntlet as a as a game where we just I just wanted to see if it worked and then you know tweaked and uh when we got towards the end of last year uh I think October November uh I had run it some more and people started asking for a a play test pack and so that's when we we put something together that anybody could run from and uh People have been running it as a game, like not as a play test, but as, as a game. Mm-hmm. And then we've been getting feedback from players yeah. uh, on the forum threads for that. Mm-hmm. And Agatha's run it quite a bit. Yeah. I think Agatha was the first one besides me to run it. So Yeah. I I basically insinuated myself into this whole game process until I was made a co-author. <laughs> 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 That's how you do it. Pro tips, friends. Uh, <laughs> yeah. It was yeah that I we definitely didn't have like a form for people to fill out uh to testing specific things it I I feel like uh this the, the as someone who did not design the rules <laughs> I I do think that it was a pretty um it was pretty complete uh, in a lot of ways so mm-hmm. we didn't have to do a lot of stress testing there were some mm-hmm. rules that we were like okay no one ever uses this never uses this <laughs> <laughs> had to kill my darlings which is always hard yeah. um uh and, and i did reach out to some of the people who had run with specific questions about things that i saw as friction points mm. to see if they had that and i had I had some differences like there was a thing i started to cut that i got feedback that were like no no we're using it it was something that i hadn't really leaned into and that other players other gms were using in a really strong way. Mm-hmm. So that's been fun. Oh, very cool. Which, which move is that? That was the impress move. Uh, oh. I, cause I never, never have used it. And mm-hmm. Jason and some other people have been, been using it for really strong scenes. And they were like, Nope, leave it in there. And I was like, okay. Yeah. I like it too. I like telling people to do it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> awesome. Nice. So, uh, I guess let's move on and talk a little bit 
more about some of like the the like terms and concepts that will need to be that are really like specific to Hearts of Wulin. So one of the first things I think we should talk about is one of the things I'm personally most excited about, which are the elements and the conditions. Yes. So the elements are basically the stats that you would roll with for this game. And the the, the way that these work is that it's really uh, basically taken from uh, Fraser Simons of the Veil, vale, right? The mechanics, it, well, actually, do you want to talk about it? <laughs> well, I, 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 I'll, you, get, you get to talk about the other stuff. So uh, sure. I, I'll say this. Um, uh, I wanted a approach to rolling with stats that was like the veil where veil uses emotional states or like fate accelerated how they Mm -hmm. use approaches Mm -hmm. where you get a choice about what you want to do um and uh i i i took the 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 five elements um which comes from agatha this is uh, why i'm here uh, (laughs) yes the (laughs) elemental system um very loosely um but uh, uh, I wanted people to be be flexible about that so that they could use that choice to shape their actions. There are a couple of exceptions on that. Like you have a fighting style and a style is associated with a particular element. So you always roll with that, that value. You always roll. Mm-hmm. If you have a fire-based style, you're always rolling with fire. Mm-hmm. And then conversely, for your inner conflict, for your can you deal with emotional turmoil, you you can roll with anything but your style element. Oh. Um, so they, they kind of flip uh, on their head. And then uh, eventually I realized that I had harm tracks and all kinds of stuff early on, and those are gone. Mm-hmm. And essentially, if you take harm, you mark a stat, and you can't roll with that stat anymore Ooh. until you get that fixed. So over time, your options become smaller and smaller. And, it, and if, for example, your fighting style, if you uh, mark that, then you can't fight. You've got to figure out another way to handle it. Oh, wow. Um, there is a, a wounded condition, which gives you minus two ongoing that you can always fall back to, but it is a terrible choice. <laughs> uh, yeah. I love it when players make that Oof. choice because, hmm. uh, but it's, it's really, it creates that there's, there's a, 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 a connection to that is when you roll for something as you in powered by the apocalypse, uh, a fail is a six or less total. And the GM makes a a hard move in the Power of the Apocalypse games. One of the classic hard moves in this game is to say, okay, you need to mark your element. You need to mark that one. Well, you always mark the one that you rolled with. So if you're always rolling with your best stat, (laughs) eventually I'm going to make you mark that. And so there's a kind of a a risk reward uh, push your luck thing there that that I love. Oh, that's really interesting. I I haven't, I don't think I've seen that in uh, PBTA yet uh yeah. which is really cool yeah it's very cool. yeah fraser's fraser's of having the spiked state in the veil was what really inspired me to 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 play with those stats like nice. that very cool awesome so you mentioned briefly uh about styles do you guys want to talk about that a little bit more Sure. I mean, style is is a very kind of character creation and narrative flavor uh, side of it, where you pick you you again you pick your fighting style, and there is a list of um, fighting style names that you can choose from, and then you can also choose your weapon. So this is all associated with that. Again, there's a style element, so an element an element associated with your fighting style, and it kind of based on the description of the element that you choose it kind of informs the way that that visually uh you can describe how you fight as well but other than that yeah it's 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 not a mechanic Hmm. very Uh, cool cool and then you've got what six playbooks right now and can you tell us a little bit about uh those six and and what separates them from each other well i'll i'll say what uh, then i'll let agatha describe the the six but uh the each of our playbooks is a particular archetype, but then we have three roles. Like uh, you choose a particular version of that because I didn't want to do 18 playbooks. Yeah. Um, so uh, we have uh, uh, each one has uh, a different role that has sort of a, a, a unique move. And then there's a pool of, of moves that they, they choose from in there. Oh, cool. Um, yeah, I can go into the playbooks. Um, I like the way that you describe them, Lol. But I, I I'll, I'll take them on my spin. Um, so the the, <laughs> the six that the six overarching playbooks are the aware, the bravo, the loyal, the outsider, student, 
and the unorthodox. And so I, why don't we split them in half? I'll, I'll describe the first. Okay. Thing. Yeah. So the, sure. the aware is a very knowledge based sort of, um, uh, a playbook. And again, knowledge based is not, not really in terms of like, oh, okay, so this like a wizard, right? No, this is more like in terms of like narrative positioning. Uh, your character is always kind of coming from that perspective. Um, and a lot of times also a wiser uh, type of character is, can be created with this. Uh, so the backgrounds are there's a master who's, again, like that kind of peaceful um, person. And they have a move associated with that background where they they try to pacify aggressive situations. And then there's a scholar, which is, as the name implies, it's very knowledge based, like, oh, OK, I have a lot of times you get more advantages when you say, I think I have knowledge of a historical situation that matches up with this or so on. And there's also the traveling uh, Sifu, which is um, when when you can also like observe people based on the kind of wisdom and knowledge that you have from being um, maybe older and more experienced. Ooh. And then the next one, the Bravo, is, is almost like an opposite of that kind of archetype. <laughs> the Bravo is definitely the... Oh, I don't want to say it's the fun one, but it, it <laughs> it's the one it's the one uh, character that um, that that is that's very exuberant and it gets to kind of like throw rules to the wind because they can get away with it. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, so their um, their backgrounds are the favorite eldest again. So oh, you, you're the eldest and you get advantages of being an eldest and again just uh, the historical part of this, this kind of story. Um, and or there's an, the gallivant uh, background where you just you travel from place to place and you're kind of just like oh yeah like. Um, I I uh, I leave behind a trail of broken hearts, but that's what I do because this is my life. Um, <laughs> and then there's all the thief. So again, this is the this kind of this kind of fun rules are for losers kind of uh, a playbook. Mm -hmm. And then the next one is the loyal, which is I think a lot of times what people associate with maybe like the wuxia genre or when they speak of the, the whole like a warrior archetype. Um, mm -hmm. So. Loyal is a lot about, um, they, it's about their loyalties um, to whatever they, they have placed it. So one of the backgrounds is the devoted child. Um, they to, Their loyalty definitely rests very firmly within their family, uh, per, perhaps in their parental figure, but definitely this is the center of their of their lives and their importance and then another one and then the background is the official which lol has said is is one of his favorites isn't that what you said before oh yeah absolutely yeah and this one is really fun because you get to play like a magistrate judge or civil servant and then you have ties associated with that but also obligations associated with that so that's and it's like you get to play like a very righteous person or not i guess but you definitely um these are kind of like this is the most important thing to you outside of like being a martial master and so on and then there's also the swordsman which is which is that uh that archetypal trope which is um you you're you're you serve your family and clan and you are extra tough because you're a warrior um and, and that's and there are this mechanical uh aspects associated with that and then the outsider is actually, in some ways, kind of the opposite of the loyal. And the loyal is deeply within the, the Wulin world. The outsider is outside of that. So we have the character who's the rebel, who's fighting against something, maybe the factions themselves in the Wulin world or the, the emperor. Uh, we have the trickster. Uh, they can always con people. Uh, they always have the positioning to, to, to pull one over on other people. Um, and then there's the the wanderer, just the the, the wandering uh, uh, person who's going from place to place and is, has traveled the land that that doesn't have a settled home. Uh, and then the fifth one is the student. Uh, this is the character that's about kind of uh, learning and knowledge and seeking approval in some way. So we have uh, a hopeful apprentice uh, who can hold their own uh, against big you know, higher scale characters uh, for just a little bit longer than anybody else. Uh, the Wandering Monk, which has, you know, the, the sort of temple associations. Yeah, and, Monk. And the, yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Uh, and then the younger sibling, uh, who is a character who has given themselves to 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 serve their family and, and hopefully rise up. And and they're probably not treated very well. Um, and so that's that's them. The last playbook is the one we added a little bit deeper in the process um, is the unorthodox. And this is sort of the wild card uh, set. Uh, the wild card playbook, and in fact, it's the one that potentially has a little more, a little more gonzo, or it can change what's going on uh, in the setting. So GMs may want to look at it to see whether they want to use it or not. There's the accidental to character who uh, doesn't know martial arts, but somehow they do know martial arts, and they can kind of stumble <laughs> through fights. Um, we have the hidden. This is the the character who's deliberately trying to hide. That they know they're, you know, for whatever reasons they're being hunted or they've hurt someone or, or whatnot. Uh, and then the prodigy is the character who has great power that they can't control. So it's a little bit of my avatar, last airbender kind of, uh, uh, throw it in, in, in that one. And, uh, that, that is hugely popular. So. Wait, uh, is I've the Prodigy surprised. very popular? I've never seen someone play that before. Oh, I've had the Prodigy in at least three or four times. Oh. Ooh. Very cool. Awesome. So um, let's talk a little bit about some of the entanglements that these characters are going to be getting into. Oof. <laughs> so so we have um, the way that entanglements work in this game is they, they basically serve as uh, backstory uh, n- prompts uh, and to f- between uh, PCs, but also possibly to NPCs. Uh, but these also have a mechanical uh, weight within this game. So uh, how it works is every uh, every PC, you would choose one romantic and one general entanglement for your character. And these entanglements are statements. So I can just read from one of these example ones. Uh, for example, I love so and so, but so and so, a leader of my faction, has forbidden it. So uh, there's always two blank spaces in there where you fill in the names um, of either two. You can either do like oh two PCs, or they could be one PC and one NPC. But they always need to have, generally speaking, they always need to have a PC in there, and this will tie you into each other. And it's also a great way to create a lot of complicated backstory, especially because. Um, Every single PC needs to choose two for themselves. Then they don't necessarily need to reflect whatever other people have chosen for them. So one person can say, I'm in love. For example, I can say, my character is in love with Lowell's character. And Lowell can say, my character is in love with <laughs> with Adira's character. And it just like goes on <laughs> into this like complicated web. Um, and, we, and people never repeat entanglements because there are so many to choose from. That's not... A problem so it, it it's a great way to create backstory but it also uh has narrative consequences in game because um for one thing that's a really good way for you to get experience <laughs> uh you <laughs> we always ch- choose one uh entanglement to highlight per session and uh the, the highlighted one will will give you four experience uh no three experience at the end of the session and then the other one that wasn't highlighted if oh sorry the f- <laughs> So the one that's highlighted, if uh, if that theme is touched on or any sort of that story thread is touched on during play, uh, then you get the three experience points associated with it. Mm. And then the other one that wasn't highlighted, if you kind of touched on that as well, you get another experience point from it. So this is a great way for people to be focusing on the, their, the narrative backstories that they've chosen because mm-hmm. everyone wants to level up. <laughs> You're all about that. Or conversely, if you keep yeah, if you keep playing to these stories, then you also get in it, you know, you get experience out of it. Um, and another uh, aspect of these entanglements is that uh, they're basically um, uh, the way that uh, that inner conflict, which is one of the moves in this game, gets triggered. And Lol, do you want to talk about inner conflict? So inner conflict is our, when you come face to face with a situation involving your entanglement like you run into the person who you love and they start telling you about how they're in love with this other person uh that's that's the point at which you roll inner conflict and inner conflict either you hold yourself steady or uh the sort of seven to nine is you mark an element uh or you have to flee the situation uh, and then the fail state is things get terrible, like misunderstandings <laughs> and, you know, betrayals and, and all of all of that come in. And it is 
it's the engine for the game, quite honestly. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Once you get that rolling, uh, it, it goes from there. Yeah. yeah. So characters have entanglements, but they also have bonds. How do those interplay with each other? So uh, bonds are, are are the currency for assisting other players. So you have these connections or bonds. They're mechanically tracked. Like if I would have a bond with uh, Agatha's character, I'd have it a one or two or even up to three. And you can burn those bonds to, to give a bonus to a roll after you roll it. So it, it's very much our currency. And those come out of entanglements now uh, where at the start you get two bonds and you draw one bond from each of your entanglements. Okay. Very cool. Cool. Yeah. And so the last thing we want to talk about is scale. All right. <laughs> yeah. Do you want to, I, I want to give your take on that? All right. Okay. So the way that, the way that fights work, uh, duels specifically work in this game. The duel is the name of the, the, the move you would roll if you wanted to fight, uh, is that, um, it's, it's, how the result of the fight goes is based on the scale of your the PC's opponent. Mm. And the way that the, the scale works is that it is always um, tied back to the perspective of the PC. So it's not there's not an objective scale the, where uh, people would fall on different spectrums. It's more like, OK, this PC is fighting against uh, this dude who uh, looks pretty cool, but is probably not the big bad. OK, so their scale, uh, I'm as the GM is going to say is on the same level as uh, cool. as the PC, and then there are two only two other scales as, aside from being equal to each other. One is uh, greater than the PC, and one is lesser than the PC. And then the way you roll, um, Lo, did you want to take over from there? <laughs> uh, yeah, basically, if if you're fighting someone who's on a lower scale than you, which can include like groups of troops, uh, you're going to win. Like, period. That's what's going to happen. Uh, you know, with, with their, you know, on a fail, you get to choose if you lose and you can mark XP, but generally you're going to win. If you fight somebody above your scale, you lose. That's period. That's how it works. Um, and, uh, your role determines whether you get to narrate how you lose or not. Oh. Um, and so you want to roll well there so that you can have a little bit of control over what happens to you. Uh, and then if you're, if you're on, the same scale with person, then it's more questionable. Then there are different sets of results and some choices and things like that. And things can happen a little bit differently, but normally all fights are one role. That's it. We do a role. That's our fight. We saw how it happened. Um, we do, we describe to get into the setup of it. We, we talk about what you're doing you, and then you roll and you tell me how cool you were, mm-hmm. um, or how tragic you were, yeah. uh, as the case may be. Yeah. Um, and then there's, there's mechanics in the game for how you, change scale or how you even scale over time there yeah i i love that i love that scale system that you just yeah, described that's, really cool. that's that's great it reminds me a lot of ranks and amber diceless mm-hmm. it's it's so cool yeah it's a little bit like that and uh, mouse guard yeah it kind mm-hmm. of it's a bigger thing smaller yeah thing, exactly so. like yeah oh, yeah very cool i'm really excited uh is there anything else that we want to cover uh before we head into character creation no that sounds good <laughs> okay. okay well hey let's make some people Let's make some people. Sweet. So are there any uh, playbooks from our brief pitches that y'all are more interested in? Hmm. I was actually, I went to the entanglement tab and started reading some of those uh, Mm -hmm. to get an idea of, uh, because it looks like each playbook has their own set of entanglement questions, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I have curated a set because players were like, these lists are too long. So I, I curated a set of three romantic and three general for each of the playbooks uh, to make it easier for people. Um, but but you can always go and look at the big, big, big list uh, if, ah, if none of those appeal. I see yeah, the big, big, big. Scroll oh, my to the goodness. right, yeah. <laughs> oh, my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> I can see why that, that would be a little intimidating to to select from the, the extremely large list there for both of those. Yeah. When I'm at a convention, I actually have these all on cards, and I'll deal out a set of cards oh, interesting. to the players to choose from, oh. which, which has worked pretty oh, well. Oh, that sounds yeah. great. You are so yeah. much more prepared than I was. I remember you telling me that that's what you did. And then what I did was I took um, a piece of paper that I had already printed something else on. And then I took I printed on the back side of it <laughs> some of the entanglements <laughs> and not all of them because I was like, I don't have any more paper. So everyone shared this one piece. It was the worst plan. Oh, man. <laughs> 
that's amazing. Hmm. Yeah, so I wouldn't think of uh, defining your character based on these entanglements mm -hmm. as opposed to the playbooks because yes. the playbooks are definitely more yeah specific. Oh, so many good choices too. So, hmm, I think uh, like one of the things that comes to mind for me when I think about the genre is uh, the movie Curse of the Golden Flower. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> yeah. Um, and uh, I really like the, 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 like the, the queen. I think she's a very interesting character. Uh, and so I was trying to think about like a playbook where I could sort of do some of those sorts of things. Well, one of the interesting things is because we've got these playbooks very generalized mm -hmm. is you can take uh, something and and reshape it. Like, for example, you could take the outsider mm -hmm. and the trickster because trickster always can manipulate people, can mm -hmm. always change, you know, uh, uh, and interact. And there's a there's a thing with that character in there is she always, even when she's in a bad position, can can talk people into things. Yeah. Um, so so that that's a that's a way to go about about that. Mm -hmm. Um, hmm. and I could see some other ways, but that's, that's what occurs to me right off the top of my head. Yeah. Yeah. It's, there's like some obvious things like possibly, a, a idea like playing off of the official, um, mm -hmm. cause then you get some contacts, you can have a network of, of people. Yeah. You could even possibly do the master and aware. Mm -hmm. Um, hmm. Interesting. I'm, I'm trying to, um, figure out whether I want to fully embrace my brand or uh, push against it. Yeah. Uh, Amelia's got me uh, kind of trying to push against my uh, super, uh, super honorable, super like peaceful sort of brand. Mm -hmm. Oh. Um, and maybe try something a little bit more uh, devious. Well, yes. if you're if you're playing against type, then I think I'll probably go against type a little bit. Um, I play a lot of characters that are very uh, uh, stabby. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> Fair enough. So what you're saying is you're going to use a staff for this game. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Copy yeah. that. That's yeah. Crazy. If I was if I was thinking on type, um, I would probably be. Uh, looking more at like one of like the like flexible weapons or like uh, throwing knives and throwing weapons and things like that in general. But hmm, playing against, huh. I'm kind of uh, leaning towards the unorthodox prodigy. Cool, it's a fun one. Yeah, yeah, because I'm thinking of uh, like a character that has these you know, abilities, these extra talents that they don't know how to fully control, but they think they are, you know, the bee's knees. They're, mm -hmm. they're like, yeah, I can do all this cool stuff because yeah. I am the greatest thing that this world has ever seen. <laughs> I think I'm going to go master. Nice. Okay. All right. What about you two? Okay. I, I haven't really thought about playbook yet, but I just figure out my, what my weapons are going to be. Uh, I'm not going to say them right now because I'm so excited. Uh, <laughs> so I'll hold that back. Uh, Lol, what are you thinking of? Uh, I'm going to be the loyal official. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> Finally, you get to be. <laughs> Absolutely. Sweet. And uh, uh, I fight with a brush. Nice. Nice. Big, a big iron brush, but a brush nonetheless. Nice. That's amazing. Okay, so we have we have an aware, a loyal, and an unorthodox. Huh. Okay, so bumbling, serious, pacifist. Hmm. So should we be claiming a color on the spreadsheets? I'm taking the yellow one. Okay. Because yellow is the weakest. I will color. take uh, the teal-ish one on the left because that's my favorite color. So on the on the character sheet, um, yeah. For the role, is that your your playbook and your like like I would yeah, be the playbook and role. Product. Yeah. I think I'll take the red one. There you go. It's red, right? That is a reddish color. Yes. Cool. I'm colorblind, so. Oh, that's fine. Oh, okay. 
Did you want us to change the color? Because we can do no, that. No, it's fine. Okay, sounds good. All right, so I think I'm going to choose the Wandering Monk. Nice. Interesting. <sighs> but I don't want to revel in naivete. Don't tell me what to do, player agenda. <laughs> 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 I'm just kidding. You're not the boss of me. <laughs> oh, interesting. I saw the I see the player agenda down there. Yeah, so all, the top four are always the same across the board. Oh, okay. Um, so it's embrace sincerity. Oh, wait. Did you uh, speak obliquely about the heart, play with everyone's entanglements, and act in the service of something greater? Mm-hmm. These are things that we all should do, and then you have a special one just for you. Conceal your truth for me. Yeah. Ooh. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. So um, how would that change somebody who thinks they're all that? You don't have to. It, they're just inspirations, uh, and some of them are well, more. I think, though, though, in your context, uh, uh, conceal your truth is the fact that you're not as good as you think you yeah. are. Oh snap! That, nice. might, that might be true. Yeah, I, I like Ooh, that. That cuts. Oh, like I all, be purple. All this cool extra stuff is uh, just kind of accidental. You know, I true. meant to do that. Okay, so it looks like after we've got our playbook set we should do look next yes cool oh and make sure when you pick your background uh that you copy and paste that onto the first section of the moves because there is a mechanical uh aspect associated with it and usually there's a move so you copy paste that as well all right so for looks it looks like we've got a lot of different appearance and dress options here yes cool pick as many or as little as you want i will say that both agatha and i have probably spent more hours working through pinterest boards for for pictures for these characters uh that we've we've been when we've run then to maybe we have actually running the game would that seem like a fair statement that is the absolute truth yeah it's it's more important to look good yes i don't want to make him smarmy these are a, a great, like, breadth and depth of these. I like these. Yeah, there's a lot of interesting, uh, like, combinations that you could probably make with these sorts of uh, appearance descriptors. Yeah. Um, a gentle face, glowing skin, hopeful eyes. Pallid skin, unflinching gaze. Mm-hmm. Unkempt hair, dark and stealthy dress. Interesting. Unassuming. That's got to be one of mine. So should we order these in like a sentence? Should it just be like a list? I've always just put it in a list. Mm. Some people will write out a full description, but uh, I've always just kind of picked out aspects that I like. All right, friends. What do you think about the term stern grin? What does that evoke in your mind? Mm. Like a st- I, Okay, go ahead. I think stern grin is like a, a grin that doesn't necessarily like extend much past the sort of the center of the face. There's a set jaw as part of it. Um, mm. It's just like maybe we're not sure how sincere you are yeah. about the the grin. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> I'm, yeah. I'm thinking. Uh, oh. I think it's got like a connotation of judgment to it. Oh, yeah. Interesting. Okay. Like I'm not picking that. <laughs> 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 that doesn't work with my character concept. It's almost, I might. It's almost like a, you're I, in trouble, and I know you're in trouble, and I'm going to enjoy you being in trouble. I just picked Stern Grin now because of this conversation, so. <laughs> Stern Grin is its own character, I think. <laughs> All right. Move. Uh, oh, dress. Bare armed. Yes, bare armed for sure. Because he's got to show off his uh, quote unquote muscles. Even though he's uh, petite and unassuming. You can be petite and unassuming and still have sweet muscles. I don't think he has sweet muscles. Ah. Yeah. I, <laughs> I think he's like this. He he thinks he's all that because of his like special abilities that he can't control. But uh, he's just this little pipsqueak that uh, just tries to like, you know, show off more than what he really is. Man glowing skin that's all i want in life Uh huh. <laughs> so we should also pick our name when we're picking our look it looks like and uh, you can 
uh, I have a factions and names tab with lots of examples yeah. on there if you need help. Yeah, I'm looking at so. that right now. Hmm. All right. Factions and names. Other names. Factions for Hearts of Ulitend. Interesting. Oh, style names too. Wow. Ageless Sin. Well, oh, that's an interesting name. Yeah. Anti Heartless. Wow. These names are amazing. I love making up names for this game. <laughs> <laughs> I actually think my favorite is Bow. <laughs> Just bow. <laughs> yeah, because it always makes me think of um, baozi, which is the term the, for buns. Yeah, the double <laughs> buns. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I can't. In the very it. first game, or no, uh, the big like thirteen session game we did last year, uh, the one of the, the the sort of the bumbling villains that became more serious throughout was Magistrate Bow. Bow. And uh, uh, it was he was, was bumbling at the start, and it was he was a cute. <laughs> so cute. Oh yeah, do we did we pick uh, the um, gender pronouns for our characters yet? Oh, that's a good idea. I was thinking um, male, he, him for mine. Cool. Yeah, and I will say one of the things we would have done is we have all the characters set up that we would talk about the setting and the safety tools and considerations and things like right. that. Just just people know that we we have all of that process. What safety tools do you generally use? Uh, I tend to fall, tend to fall back on the X card mm -hmm. uh, because it's the, the simplest thing, and I run a lot online, and uh, so that's what I do. I, it's not the best tool, mm -hmm. uh, but it is a, a good one for that kind of situation. Um, I've been playing recently with the uh, red, uh, yellow, green. Oh yeah, uh, safety tool. Are you liking that? It, it's it's nice because it's got the active sort of. Uh, consent built into it where if you really like what's going on and if it's a little heavy still, you can hold up a green and say, and I like this, let's keep going. Um, oh, nice. And then if things are kind of approaching your un discomfort territory, but you're still fine with it, you can hold up yellow saying, hey, you know, just be careful. There there might be some boundaries that we're pushing against here, but we can keep going. Um, and whether or not your group wants to discuss things at that point, that's fine. Um, and then you hold up a red object, and that means stop. We hit something that I'm not good with at all. Interesting. That's yeah. pretty similar to OK Check-In, which is a safety mechanic that I use in LARPs constantly. Yep. And I also mm. will just sort of use with my spouse mm -hmm. <laughs> in the world. <laughs> <laughs> LARPs are fantastic for, I think, online uh, safety tools. Because mm. uh, if you have only a webcam... Uh, to see people as you're chatting with, and instead of like a physical thing that you can press on the table, uh, as long as people are able to see everybody in the chat, you just have to do the the sign or or hold up the object or or whatever. It's one of the things to be really happy with in the gauntlet is we require if you're going to run for us, you have to use a safety tool. You have to instruct the players about it. Yeah, it's a minimal requirement. And that has also generated a lot of discussion about how to use it and people talking about the tools they've used and their experiences. And I've been really happy that that has fostered people refining their technique on that. Yeah. It seems to be getting a lot more popular nowadays. So I'm going to go with ah uh, for my character. Is, is that um, the pronunciation or? It is, but I highly recommend against doing that because just because when we're playing a lot of times uh, i is just a very common verbal pause that right. it's hard to tell sometimes when you're like oh, uh -huh. is uh, i kind i kind of uh -huh. want that though i mean since we're not going to be playing it's fine but <laughs> also um i kind of wanted that as part of the character uh especially if you're playing a game and he's constantly like thinking he's the center of attention interesting Okay, yeah. I think a part of it, and I think we can totally do that. Uh, part of what, what holds me back is like, I is usually added in front of another uh, character for uh, like people's nicknames for each, each other in, oh. um, in Chinese. So in both Mandarin and Cantonese. Uh, so a lot, like, and there's no, there isn't a lot of other characters that are associated with that sound mm -hmm. um, aside from that. So it's always like, uh, it's like, I'm just immediately like, oh, and it, it it should be followed by something. So then it's like nickname. <laughs> and like, usually people would use that for kids or like for like their friends that are they're closer to and so on. He looks um, like a kid. Yeah, we'll have to have you go through the, the name list and the, the quick start because of the samples mm. to, to make sure I've got good ones in there that you think are interesting. Mm -hmm. I got you. 
yeah but you can totally still do that since yeah again we're not playing so yeah it's all good it's all good we can push the boundaries of character creation because we don't play these characters so based off of some of the other names i was seeing a lot of interesting things that are a lot more like titles like perfected starfall and jade serpent and things like that uh that i'm thinking of going with black petal yeah mm. that sounds cool yeah my character's pronouns are she her so are these uh these are these other names uh it looks like oh yeah like either titles or um like nicknames names you're known by effectively mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. yeah so people can choose whether they want to have a common name you know a, a a more conventional name or they could mix that up with like brother lao or or however mm-hmm. they wanted to with the title and then the the convention is are these names for people that they take on these kind of titles and role names that they they assume and so and they're super colorful so. awesome yeah, maybe i'll maybe i'll switch to that because i i have a feeling he he would uh at the very least invent a name for himself and this is like so against my like normal humbleness to play a, <laughs> such a boisterous character. <laughs> That's great. Um, okay. Oh man, there's so many other other good names here too. Would uh, Perfected Fist be a decent name? Sure. Sweet. Yeah. I'll go with Perfected Fist. Perfected Fist. I love it. I think I broke something in my spreadsheet cell. It's not going down to the next line when I type. And if I try and put a return, oh. it's not working. Hmm. Um, you need to wrap. Ah, there you go. Ah, thank so, you. You're so welcome. I cheated and I uh, pulled a picture <laughs> for my character, <laughs> <laughs> which is in the image uh, link area on the bottom of this oh. character. Okay, now I got to find someone. Oh no. <laughs> Now, if I go down that rabbit hole, I will be there uh-huh. forever. So, I will be <laughs> that's true. <laughs> awesome. Um, okay, so I have. What do I have? Oh, I need a faction now too. And you don't have to necessarily. So, what we do is the the factions are a thing that you can come up with to to assign names as you're doing your entanglements or mm. as you're thinking about your backstory. So that that's a kind of a, a loose thing. Some people will come up with it now because they want a cool name, and some people will come up with it as they're they're doing the entanglements. Okay, I think I'll hold yeah. off on that then. Yeah, it looks like the next thing to do after look and name is determine your style, associating it with one of the well elements. Mm-hmm. Okay. And this is the, the, the style, as, as Agatha said earlier, is very much a color uh, thing, with the exception of deciding which element it's associated mm-hmm. with. Um, and so your, your weapon, if your weapon's taken away, you can still fight um, and that kind of thing. But this is about what, what you're known for and what you can really do awesome things right. with. Okay, so, so the style name is going to be just the name of the style, and it, that can be completely made up at that point. Yeah, absolutely. There's some examples, but you're going to come up with whatever you okay. want. All right. I think my style name is going to be Broken Mountain. How about uh, Smoldering Crater? Oof. <laughs> <laughs> you're really leaning into this. And I'm yeah. <laughs> awesome. And the weapon. Interesting. And it can be barehanded uh, yeah. uh, as, as you approach as well. I think unarmed, yeah. Question mark? All right, so my weapon is unarmed. Okay, I have a question. Is there a word or a phrase for like, um, so, okay, like a tactical thing in battle, like when you're like, oh, for sure people are going to, they're going to pass by this route. So let's set up a- an attack for them. Is there an ambush? An ambush. ambush. Yep. Oh, interesting. Okay, great. <laughs> okay. So I think once we uh, once we get all of this set, we'll go over everything that we selected. Thank you for joining us for part one of this character creation series. We'll be back in part two, picking up right where we left off. Character Creation Cast is a production of the One Shot Podcast Network and can be found online at www.charactercreationcast.com. Head to the website to get more information on our hosts and guests, or even some of our character sheets. Character Creation Cast can be found on Twitter at CreationCast. I'm one of your hosts, Ryan Bolter, and I can be found on Twitter at 
Lord Neptune. Our other host, Amelia Antrim, can be found on Twitter at Ginger Reckoning. Music for this episode is used with a Creative Commons license or with permission from the podcast they originated from. Further information can be found within the show notes. Our main theme music is Hero Remix by Steve Combs and is used with a Creative Commons license. This podcast is owned by us under Creative Commons. This episode was edited by Ryan Bolter. Further information for the game systems used in today's guests can also be found in the show notes. If you like the systems discussed and wish to purchase them, links to the products can be found in the show notes. Also, check the notes or the website for cool stuff to go with each character, such as dice or mixtapes. Thanks for joining us. And remember, we find that the best part of any role-playing game is character creation. So go out there and create some amazing people. We will see you next time. Read some show blurbs. Show blurbs. Show blurbs. Show blurbs. Show blurbs. Character Creation Cast is hosted by the One Shot Podcast Network. If you enjoyed our show, visit One Shot Podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Just keep, keep going. <laughs> if you enjoyed our show, visit OneShotPodcast.com, where you'll find other great shows like Backstory. Backstory is a cozy, thoughtful interview show featuring the most fascinating folks in role-playing. Join host Alex Roberts as she gets to know game designers, LARP rights, scholars, community organizers, and more. From emerging artists to seasoned veterans, guests open up about their creative process, what keeps them engaged, and their visions for the future of role-playing. <laughs>